Aloha, everybody. I'm Pedro Haro, Executive Director of the American Lung Association in Hawaii. Welcome to the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander and Lung Health webinar. Please enter your questions in the chat box and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. I am pleased to be joined by some of my colleagues from the American Lung Association, as well as two fabulous experts, Kim Burney and Rod Liu. Before we jump into our panel discussion, I would like to turn it over to Harold Wimmer, our national president and CEO for opening remarks. Harold. Thank you, uh, Pedro, and hello everyone, and thanks for joining us for the American Lung Association's webinar, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders and Lung Health. As the nation's longest standing public health organization, the American Lung Association truly has an extensive history of health promotion and advocacy work to reduce health disparities by both raising awareness of disparities and also taking action to address them. In our work to improve lung health, we want to reach all Americans, but especially those most vulnerable. As you know, today's webinar is on the disparities faced within Asian American, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islander communities. Uh, we're very fortunate to have an expert group of panelists who will discuss the systemic issues contributing to these disparities and ways that we can tackle these immense public health challenges. This webinar is a part of a series of events and resources we are highlighting in honor of the federally recognized AAPI Heritage Month. We recognize that the term AAPI is a difficult one as it aggregates very large groups of people and at the same time can leave out some. So we welcome the opportunity for Lung Association staff, as well as our partners, to understand more about Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders during the month of May and throughout the year. We also celebrate the significant contributions to lung health by these communities in collaboration with our National Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council, in addition to this webinar, we have several special features focused on these communities on our website. So we certainly encourage you to visit our resources on lung.org. Now I'd like to turn it back to Pedro. Thank you so much, Harold. Uh, when the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council was trying to determine how to commemorate uh, the month, uh, and you know, I say AAPI in quotes, and that's deliberate, we knew that we had to create something that got to the heart of one of the main issues of the, um, the term AAPI, and that's the aggregation of people that share no common language, no common geography, nor history. In reality, by grouping these communities within one label, it reduces the availability of accurate and detailed data collection that is critical for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islander communities, which are some of the fastest growing populations in the United States today. By, the, by aggregating data, uh, gaps in services, in insurance coverage, and rates of disease are masked, and we fail to provide interventions for some of our populations with the highest needs. As you see from this slide, even healthcare coverage varies widely amongst the groups represented within the AAPI label, from 5.3 with Japanese Americans to 27% to Tongan Americans. Data disaggregation is key to ensuring that the issues facing all of these communities are addressed. While there will be a little bit of history shared in this webinar, by no means is this supposed to be a primer about the communities that the speakers will cover. Rather, we hope that this webinar will be the jumping point for you as public health professionals to learn more about Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, their complicated history with the United States government and the various health disparities that exist today. With that, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today. I am very proud to turn it over to Nicole Mannion who will guide us the rest of the way. 
Thank you and good morning everyone. My name is Nicole Mannion and I'm the Health Promotion Specialist for the American Lung Association in Hawaii. My role with the Lung Association involves over overseeing all of our health promotions activities and programs for the state of Hawaii. This includes program promotion and implementation, grant oversight and management and partnership development. In addition to these duties, I also ensure that all things health promotions are adapted and conducted in a manner that is culturally appropriate to our audiences and the populations we serve here in Hawaii. I am thrilled to facilitate this webinar today and have the pleasure of allowing today's speakers to introduce themselves in further detail. First up, we have Kim Burney of Papa Ola Lokahi. Kim is the Communications and Engagement Coordinator at Papa Ola Lokahi. Kim, could you share more about your history at Papa Ola Lokahi, please? Uh, thank you, Nicole. Uh, thank you to the American Lung Association, to Pedro Hara, uh, and to Mr. Harold Wimmer. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be um, to be speaking with the American Lung Association today. So aloha to you all. Uh, yes, my name is Kim Kuule Burney. I'm with Papa Ola Lokahi, which is the Native Hawaiian Health Board. It was created by an act of Congress passed in 1988 called the Native Hawaiian Health Care Improvement Act. Um, there are three elements to that uh, legislation, that federal legislation. There's Papa Ola Lokahi, where I am. There are five Native Hawaiian health care systems that provide direct and enabling services across seven islands. And there's the Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship Program to build an appropriate workforce uh, for Native Hawaiians. Um, and that's modeled after the National Health Service Corps. And I was led to Papa Ola Lokahi. Uh, well, actually, I worked for the scholarship program for a little while before I actually um, uh, uh, took the current position that I'm in now. But before that, I worked with the health departments and ministries out in the U.S. Associated Pacific. There was an initiative called uh, the Governor's, um, Governor's Pacific Health Promotion and Development Center. I almost forgot the name of it. And that enabled me to, um, to go out to the U.S. So what we called then the U.S. Associated Pacific um, and to work with the different um, health directors out there. Um, I was able Able to coordinate resources with um, with the health departments and ministries. But in 1997, I met my co-panelist, Rod Liu, who uh, was just, uh, well, he was the coordinator for Appeal, and I know he'll talk about that a little bit more. And here in Hawaii, I served on the inaugural Coalition for Tobacco-Free Hawaii. So that kind of brought me into the world of lung health, um, although certainly lung related diseases are not foreign to me or to my family or 25% of Native Hawaiians um, do have asthma. So um, that's uh, kind of a start. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's kind of a little bit of a start. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Kim. Our next speaker is Rod Liu. Rod is the founder and executive director of Asian Pacific Partners for Empowerment, Advocacy and Leadership, also known as Appeal. Rod, please share more with us about your role in your organization. Yes, thank you so much, Nicole. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. OK, um, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you may be located. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to the American Lung Association uh, to Pedro Haro and to Harold um, Wimber for the kind uh, invitation to be a part of this um, very exciting conversation about the AAPI uh, dilemma. Um, my name is Rod Liu. Um, I am a third generation Chinese American. Um, both of my uh, grandparents on both my paternal and maternal side came from China in the early 1900s um, and I grew up in California. Um, we started Appeal, Asian Pacific Partners for Empowerment, Advocacy, and Leadership, as a national organization at a time in 1994 when there was a real need for advocates to particularly address issues around commercial tobacco control for our diverse Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities. From the very beginning, it was really important for us to be inclusive and so we um, spent a fair amount of time reaching out to many different 
ethnic subgroups among Asian Americans, but also trying to include and involve Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, not only in the U.S., but also, as Kim described, in the um, U.S.-associated Pacific Island jurisdictions. Uh, as a national organization, we're really focused a lot on advocacy, um, but we also recognize that our communities are at very different readiness stages to engage in advocacy and policy. So we spend a lot of our time um, investing in community building or capacity building, which also includes leadership development. So we've trained over 1,500 um, community leaders, not just from our communities, but also from other communities of color and LGBTQ. Uh, so that's a little bit about um, myself and the appeal. Wonderful, thank you, Rod. Next slide, please. So let's start off by setting today's stage. Um, many of our colleagues and partners across the continental US are not familiar with the variety of groups that label that the label of Asian American Pacific Islander, also known as AAPI, includes. Would you both mind talking about this and possibly why those groups are even grouped together at all? Um, we can start with Rod first and then go into Kim. Yeah, so my understanding of the term Asian American really was developed in 1968 by Yuji Ichioka and Emma G, who were forming a political alliance as a way of, of um, bringing together diverse Asian American groups in solidarity. And it was really kind of an effort to replace uh, a racist and colonialist term, um, Oriental, that had been used up to that time. Um, so it was really a political strategy to bring together um, different groups under one umbrella. And then probably in the 1980s, the U.S. Census added PI to that AAPI, and I'm sure Kim will talk a little bit more about that. Um, perhaps as a way to be more inclusive, but as we know, there are some um, tremendous negative ramifications of joining those groups together. Great. Kim, we can turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure I can answer the why. I, I really appreciate the history that Rod just mentioned, but um, to answer this question, what groups are included in the label of AAPI? You have the variety of peoples and cultures that originate from Asia. You have um, Pacific Islands, whether they fall into U.S. jurisdictions such as Hawaii as a state, and this is from the U.S. perspective, right? We're talking, this is a U.S. designation, a U.S. label. Um, so whether it's Hawaii, Guam, uh, Commonwealth and Northern Mariana Islands, which are all um, associated with the U.S., but you also have the other jurisdictions that were used to be trust territories and now many are fall under the compacts of free association, but they are still eligible for United States um, benefits. They still use the American dollar. Um, English is the language of the government and so forth. So there are, uh, what we all have in common is that, uh, it sounds silly to say is that our our points of origin are all west of California, but really we're so diverse in in languages, in cultures, and um, I think it's just a matter of time before, well, this is the time that we start to disaggregate and look at why it's important to separate the groups out. Hey, thank you, Kim. I do want to follow up with this just to ask um, how the populations you both work with feel about the AAPI label in your opinions. Um, I'll start. Well, you know, for Native Hawaiians, uh, the term native, one might think that we should be paired up with the Native American Alaska Indian Alaska Native 
um, groups. And in fact, uh, we have many allies among the Native and Indigenous communities in the United States. And even APHA has a caucus called Native American Alaska Native Native Hawaiian Caucus, where we do share our common interests. Um, but uh, United States has specific trust responsibilities based on tribal treaties and so forth and that do not, does not blanket Native Hawaiians. We also have many allies among the Asian American communities, but when lumped together, the true picture of uh, not only our health status, and I know that we're all in public health here, but also when it comes to other socioeconomic factors, education factors, when we're, uh, you know, when we're looking at one big rubric, really the individual issues are masked. So um, one of the things I want to mention is back in the early 90s, the Health Forum, uh, Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, used the term uh, nativity, where they looked at whether people were, whether the communities, Asian Pacific Islanders were, lived in their native homeland, such as Native Hawaiians in Hawaii, whether they lived in the United States but came from elsewhere, and whether their first generation, which, you know, for which many issues would be immigration and language access, or they were second, third, sixth, tenth generation, which is very possible in the United States as well. So um, I don't hear that. Uh, that particular field discussed too much anymore, but that was also one way of looking at the the aggregate AAPI. Thank you, Kim. Rod, any follow up on that? Yeah, you know, I would just add um, first that there are many ways that we should ally with or ally with each other um, and alliances you know, really should be around racial, ethnic um, categories. Um, and I think the importance, and I know Kim will talk about this later, is that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders um, should be recognized as these distinct racial groups, separate from Asian Americans. Um, there are problems with categorizing in one aggregate group, and Kim talked a little bit about this. But this is really around data because data drives resources, data drives funding, data drives policy. And if you don't have the granular data to really look at how distinct groups are facing challenges in health, uh, facing challenges around equity, you are not only gonna be doing a disservice to those communities by ignoring them, but you're gonna be not achieving the equity that you wanna achieve, which means reaching you know, all groups and their needs of where they are. So this whole idea of categorizing, which we call aggregation, is really kind of um, an assumption that all groups are very similar. And as we know, within Asian Americans, we're so, so diverse. Um, we may make up a certain geographic region from which original, um, you know, our, our um, community members may originate from um, in Asia throughout several different generations, but at the same time, it, it, it perpetuates what we call the model minority myth that um, not only are all Asian Americans the same, but that they are um, prosperous, they are healthy, um, that there is no needs for them. And, and this again is perpetuated throughout media. Um, I wanted to give an example where there are differences in, in um, uh, subgroups, and that includes things around poverty. There are some groups like some of the Southeast Asian groups, whether it's Hmong, the Lao, um, Cambodian groups that have higher poverty rates. Um, Korean Americans have higher uninsured rates. Um, and then talking about lung health, that issues like tobacco control or tobacco use, it's really problematic when we only have a kind of a lump aggregated data on the national level for one very heterogeneous group, uh, such as Asian Americans or AAPI. And an example of where we really need to shift this is that uh, there's data that came out of the Nas National Youth Tobacco Survey, which looked at rates of smoking uh, as well as rates of e-cigarette use. 
And when you actually combine three years of data for NHVIs, and you needed to combine three years of data because there wasn't enough numbers in a single year, you could actually show that NHPIs had the highest use of e-cigarettes among all racial ethnic groups and had the second highest use of cigarettes. Um, so that alone should really tell us that there is a problem when we don't disaggregate. Great, thank you, Rod. That actually provides a perfect segue into our next topic. Um, so next slide, great. Obviously, all of these data gaps and lumping of people also affects not just how we view these communities, but how we provide health interventions and the outcomes to those interventions. Can both of you talk to us about how aggregating these groups affects their health and their health outcomes? Some possible topics of discussion that we have briefly touched on already um, with Rod include the lack of specific data for populations, which could mean lack of dollars, erasure of people that model minority myth, how this hides health disparities, therefore making it hard to create tailored programs, and any examples in relation to COVID-19, tobacco use, lung cancer, or any other related health. Sure. So um, for Native Hawaiians, 25% uh, of uh, asthma among 25% uh, of all asthma cases are Native Hawaiian children. Compare that to 17% of the state um, across the state of Hawaii. And in Hawaii, we don't have a majority Caucasian population. So we do have Asian American, um, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian, you know, spread spread throughout. In fact, we rarely in in state, we rarely refer to API or AAPI unless it's something that's you know heard on the national level. Um, but 25% among Native Hawaiians, so that this causes us to put a little bit more attention and resources to asthma among Hawaiian children. 21% smoking rates among Native Hawaiian males, compare that to 17 across the state. And um, and we realize that we really need to um, again, devote a little bit more attention. COVID-19 has really unveiled so many inequities, not just in health, but in access to resources, in uh, living conditions, all the socioeconomic conditions that um, that you can, you know, that that we know of uh, when we look at social determinants of health. And I think that this has been a real opportunity, not just in one state, but when Texas pops up with uh, the NHPI rubric having the worst or having the highest COVID infection rates. And then you see the same thing in California and in Washington and in Oregon. Um, and then Hawaii, you know, comes around and says, ah, OK, so this is a trend that is elsewhere, too. Then you really see a coming together of all this. And uh, we've been able to talk to one another, work with one another, really work on uh disaggregating the data. So right now when it comes to COVID statistics, uh, because this is fresh in our minds, of course, when it comes to COVID, 20 states and the District of Columbia disaggregate Native Hawaiians from Asian Americans. Uh, 30 states do not at all report on NHPI. It's all grouped together as API. Hawaii is still the only state that actually disaggregates Native Hawaiians from Pacific Islanders so that we could get a truer picture. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Native Hawaiians represent about between 20, uh, well, about 20, 21 percent of the population. And Pacific Islanders represent about 4% of the population. And yet in the early uh, 2020, when the pandemic first broke out, Pacific Islanders had more than 50% of all cases. And we never would have known that had we not disaggregated and known that we needed to go into communities, we need to work with the churches, we needed to, um, uh, translate materials and information and provide it in language and do some messaging that invoked cultural and historical references so that we could really meet that. 
for the very first time statistics that came out this past Monday and Native Hawaiians have now surpassed the number only by about 35, but still we have just this week, uh, Native Hawaiians now exceed the number of COVID uh, infection rates in the state of Hawaii. We have more than Pacific Islanders and there are different things that we need to address for our communications and outreach for Pacific Islanders. We still need to improve access to resources, improve access to information and um, reach communities where they are. For Native Hawaiians, all of that is relevant, but really the issue there is the vaccinations. We need to improve information about vaccinations and reach them uh, where they are in Hawaiian communities. Um, so the strategies are a little bit different. Great, thank you, Kim. Rod, go ahead with any comments. Yeah, I think Kim did a wonderful job in providing a comprehensive response to how communities negatively get impacted, both health and in, in the community. I, I wanted to pick up on something we talked about a little bit earlier, which um, Kim mentioned around nativity, and that the disaggregation is not just by ethnic group, but we need to disaggregate by gender, um, by sexual orientation, um, by nativity, which is, you know, home country, um, by language. And an example of why that's so important is, again, using tobacco data. Um, we used to really invest in collecting um, really scientifically sound community-based data uh, through local studies that actually showed um, that um, smoking among, for example, uh, Southeast Asian men was much higher um, than for um, women, Asian American women, and also for, um, you know, those who are born in the U.S. Um, so that gives a, a, a very um, real um, backing for, for the need for local disaggregated data in many different ways. Um, and, and this is nothing new. We've been actually talking about disaggregation for more than 30 years. Um, we've um, met with the National Center for Health Statistics to try to get surveillance data to be broken down. We've talked about it with many federal agencies, many um, mainstream institutions. We've even gone through a period in the 90s where we really invested in these um, in-language um, Asian community uh, surveys, including behavioral risk factor surveys uh, for specific populations like the Chinese American, Vietnamese American or Korean American communities um, and had some really rich data that come, came out of it. But then 10 years passed, the data was no longer new and we were back to where, you know, where we um, were when we first started. So to me, the important question is why haven't things changed? Why haven't when the, we haven't been able to get data disaggregation um, uh, to make some headways um, in the way that it should be to benefit our community. And I think part of it is kind of a political question of um, political power um, and another piece is around opportunities for policy. And I'll share a little bit more about some of the data disaggregation policies um, that have been dis um, proposed here in California. Great, thank you, Ron. Um, Kim, I just want to circle that back to your comments. Um, can you expand on on what you meant by living conditions impacted and how those impacted the rates of COVID-19 for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations? Sure, I think, um, well, uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders tend to live in multi-generation families. So when there are some positive COVID cases, um, for example, uh, if, if you've got three generations or if you've got two household, two, two or more complete families living uh, in a same household or with sharing the same kitchen or sharing one bathroom, then isolation becomes an issue. And of course, then it's not just one person 
who has picked up the disease, but it's the entire family. It may be 20 or 30 members. And um, if there's not information about isolation or quarantine, or if they don't know how to ask to go to a hotel room to distance themselves from their family, or if they do go to a hotel room, but you know, still have to go out to get food. I think these are all real issues that have come up over the last year in trying to address the pandemic. And really, it's uh, it all comes down to how do you how do you address these issues when there are multi generations living together? When you have the elders or the kupuna who are at great risk and the children who are at great risk and you've got the you know the parent generation that's still trying to work to the you know to go out to work and then come back home into the household those are issues that we have been addressing uh, in addition we've been looking at um, public housing groups uh, and that's where some of the most successful vaccination events have taken place uh, for COVID simply because there are large groups of different Pacific Island communities. In one community uh, in Palolo Valley, for example, the older generation, they're Samoan, they're Tongan, they all speak English, they don't need the translated materials. The new generation of housing folks are um, are both Pacific Islander, they're Chukis, Marshallese, and also Southeast Asian. Um, and we, where we have needed to provide translated materials and send out people who can um, convey the information in language. So um, there are just so many different layers of issues. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. And thank you for sharing. Um, that's really those really insightful comments. Um, let's get into talking about what health organizations, including the American Lung Association, could be doing to make sure that there is equity for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. This includes not just our service delivery, but our policy work, our research or anything else that you believe is still lacking an equity centered approach. Some pop possible topics for this question include systems change, using proper terms, data disaggregation, and being an advocate for data dis disaggregation and policy with an equity centered approach. Um, Kim, would you like to start us off for this one? Sure, thank you. When it comes to systems change, under the category of systems change, I would say be inclusive. Include the communities you serve at all stages of planning before you even enter the community. All stages of planning, of execution, of evaluation, um, and uh, developing recommendations to, to make changes, to uh, and at, you know, to write bills, to uh, create policies, be inclusive is I think foundational for systems change. Uh, under the category of using proper terms, I would say be precise. Uh, just this past week, uh, we spoke with somebody uh, who uh, told us that they were working with Chinese and Laotian communities in Seattle and um, and how much they appreciated working with these API communities. Well, in fact, there were not any Pacific Islander communities in the project being described, but API was used over and over and over again. And, and to be frank, it's fewer words to say Chinese and Laotian communities than it is to say Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. So I would say just be precise. Uh, and that will eliminate all of the, the bucketing of the different, um, you know, the problems caused by bucketing the different groups. And um, for data disaggregation at all levels, uh, I, I didn't mention earlier OMB 15, but uh, to follow up on Rod's earlier point that we've been working on data disaggregation for decades now. And um, in fact, there is OMB 15 is a federal recommendation that really uh, recommends to all federal agencies, offices, institutes uh, and programs to disaggregate. Well, in 1997, 
a recommendation was added to OMB 15 to disaggregate Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders from Asian American. And that did happen in the 2000 census, but that has not occurred across all the other federal agencies that received this recommendation from OMB 15. So uh, one thing that we're always working on um, as the federal agencies to comply, simply comply with this 1997 recommendation. But I would say that same recommendation can be applied to uh, all of the voluntary organizations uh, to at, at the state level, at the local level, to uh, American Lung Association and all of the other voluntary organizations that look at health issues among different communities to, um, to disaggregate and at the very least, comply if you can with OMB 15. Um, that's how non-governmental organizations can be helpful and even chapters in more homogeneous communities. You know, we realize that these recommendations to break out Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander are not appropriate for all communities, but even in, in those more um, homogeneous communities, if you're specific, you will get the data that you need to adequately serve and gain resources for the communities. And um, and the other thing is to be consistent. And I'm going to bring this back to uh, COVID, if I may. Uh, Hawaii has been able to disaggregate Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander data when it comes to COVID infections and even when it comes to deaths as a result of COVID. But now we're now we're vaccinating, right? And but everybody is using the VAMS um, reporting instrument developed by the CDC and that does not disaggregate. We're working on it and some communities are doing it independently, but we're reporting out Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander data separately for infections, but not for the vaccinations. And that information is important too. So I think that recommendation is let's be consistent. Right, thank you, Kim. Uh, thanks for touching on OMB 15 and for circling back that back to COVID as well. Rod, we can go ahead and redirect to you now. Yeah, so I totally agree with what Kim shared um, around how you can support data disaggregation. I, I wanted to mention that in California, uh, Assembly Bill 1726 was passed a couple of years that requires the California Department of Public Health to disaggregate demographic data by Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander subgroups. Um, and then currently AB 1358 is adding um, additional communities of color disaggregation, as well as other categories that we talked about, including language that are really important of, in knowing um, the specific health status and health outcomes for distinct groups. So that's, that's certainly a way that, um, you know, uh, mainstream organizations and American Lung Association can help to support the data disaggregation issue. But I want to kind of come back to part of the question, which talked about health equity. Um, and health equity now is is really a buzzword. Um, people want to use it, and that's great. Um, but there hasn't been, I feel, a consistent definition of what people mean when they say health equity. Um, and a lot of the definitions that you know are out there, including probably the more most comprehensive one by Dr. Paula Braidman from UC San Francisco really talks about the fairness part of um, health equity, and I think that's really important. But I think what's missing are the two components that I think are critical elements, and that includes institutional or systems change, particularly in addressing institutional racism, and secondly, building community power. And I think if you use that as a frame, um, you begin to see that our work, whether in tobacco control or whether in public health, really needs to have a reshifting or reframing of how things have been done using an equity lens. Before, we used to kind of talk about culturally tailored materials, and that's great, culturally tailored cessation programs in language, that's very important. But I think when we talk about equity, we're really talking about a shifting in systems. And that means really talking about how we've done the work internally as an organization, 
Um, and whether that's the lung association, the health department, um, on the local level or a state level or a federal agency, those are really important. And I think what that shift means when you go from focusing on culturally tailoring to systems change is really whose responsibility is it to make this change happen? Culturally tailoring often means that it's up to marginalized communities of color, including Asian Americans and separately Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders to be the ones successful in creating that change in their communities. And, and there is a part of that, but we need to kind of start looking at those agencies who represent all communities and how that work is being done and sharing that responsibility for making sure that the system is set up in a way that creates fairness and that helps to support um, communities that are trying to um, create the change um, so that they can be healthy just like everybody else. All right. I'll go ahead and add on to this with an additional question and, and note that, you know, a lot of our national, a lot of the national orga organizations, including the Lung Association, are trying to stretch their capacity in serving interventions that are culturally competent or at the very least are culturally informed. So what are you both seeing out there that's being done right? And maybe note some things that aren't so well executed as well. Kim, would you like to start? Well, I think there are a lot of things that are being done right. Um, I think appeal is one real good example uh, where Rod is taking a look at, um, you know, whether um, whether organizations should continue, whether we should build up one another's capacity. I think it is. Um, and Appeal is looking at that, and I'm, you know, moved to truly grateful for those opportunities. Um, yeah, that uh, there, there really are. It we've been complaining for 20 or 30 years, but there really are a lot of good initiatives out there. There are a lot of um, good folks that are. Um, that are doing things right, that are including um, including communities from the very beginning. And um, there's one project, uh, there's one particular project that that uh, that I can think of right now, and uh, that includes a group of, of a Native Hawaiian group of a certain professional, and um, they're going to be included in something. And so they wanted to know about information from the very beginning. So you know, information's been reported to them, and in the very beginning, they're saying, "But we don't have enough information. We need more information." But but I think the important part there is they have it from square one. You know, they know what's happening and as things evolve, they will be informed at every step along the way instead of just at the very end, you know, say, hey, we have this great project or grant and we've written you into it um, that you're actually part of the planning process from the very beginning. Um, and actually, that's a really big subject right now. There, it, there are a lot of uh, RFIs, a lot of uh, requests for proposals that are coming out of different federal agencies, and they uh, direct. You know, should the FQHCs apply? Do de do departments of health apply? Do only uh, nonprofit organizations apply? And so everybody's writing grants, and some of them are very similar, um, but the 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 important ones, the ones that will be the most successful are the ones that will include the communities from the very beginning and not just share it with them afterwards and say, oh, we wrote you in, hope that's OK, you know, so glad we're friends. Um, <laughs> I think um, I think that's one example, and there are many examples. Just know that I, I truly know that there's a lot of really good work going on, but that's just one example that's coming to mind now. Thank you for sharing that, Kim. Rod, do you have any uh, specific examples that you would like to share? Well, I just would like to just continue what Kim said and just state that you know communities really know 
oftentimes what they need and how to go about implementing strategies that work for them. So if you invest, if you provide resources and opportunities, really communities can be facilitated or can, and find a way to figure out solutions. Um, and that's why we have invested a lot in our community leadership program, the LAMP Leadership Institute, which um, occurred in Minnesota and involved uh, training 30 fellows from five different party population groups um, is really an example of that. And two specific examples, because each community was given a policy project to work on. Um, the Asian American group decided they wanted to make the Hmong town market, which is a partially outside market, smoke free. And, and they were able, they would be able to successfully to do that. And then the African African American group was really interested in making uh, foster care smoke free in Ramsey County. And in a very short amount of time, which was probably about three or four months, they were able to convince the commissioners to sign that on, you know, sign on to that, as well as it rippled um, to other adjoining um, counties and it soon became a statewide issue. And we know that foster care home is not just African and African American. Um, families, but it includes all, all families. And so that was really an example of if you invest in communities and you facilitate a process of which they can build their own capacity, that our communities have the ability not only to address issues for our specific group, but for everybody in that region or in that city or in that state. And I think that's a really important piece about um, knowing that the potential of our communities to be successful is there. Um, I wanted to talk about policy change also because I know that policy change is important for the Lung Association as it is for other volunteers and other organizations. And certainly, you know, tobacco control policy still appears in the top 10 list of greatest public health achievements in the 20th century. So really want to give credit to all those that have been working in that category. But policy can also be an opportunity where um, you need to kind of reflect on, is it equity centered? And we know um, that some tobacco control policies, if we're not kind of thinking carefully about what the ramifications are, can unintentionally be um, inequitable. And so that can include things like um, tobacco uh, 21 or anything that has a component that requires some type of enforcement, um, particularly an enforcement that may um, involve um, police in it. Um, and some of the you know, cases of police brutality actually do incorporate um, in instance of trying to buy um, cigarettes. So we have to be careful in, in looking at uh, the content. And there's um, a group out of the American Public Health Association, the alcohol, tobacco, and other drug section that brought a group together to form a document looking at decriminalizing tobacco, knowing that some end results of policies may actually harm communities and, and really being careful about doing that. But the other piece of policy change is really the process in which policies are you know, uh, designed, developed, and, and implemented, which have really been led by, honestly, a lot of mainstream organizations and to really engage our communities who are the marginalized communities and in that effort isn't just about inviting a member from our community to join a coalition meeting, but really finding ways that policy development itself can be community led by our marginalized communities. We're engaged right now in a, a bill in California to create a health equity fund and while we do partner with some you know, uh, mainstream organizations, really they give the opportunity for communities of color to be front and center when it comes to press releases or testifying, or even uh, how a bill should be written, uh, what should be in the language, how shall monies be allocated back to communities that are most impacted um, by these issues, and even addressing kind of core social determinants of health, so not just you know, issues around diabetes or tobacco, but really kind of the foundational issues of where that those inequities were. Some of the things that Kim talked about that existed before COVID and are, are only, um, you know, amplified 
um, by COVID happening, things like housing, food security, um, those opportunities for our communities to, to help lead these efforts is really key. And I think that Lung Association and others can use some examples of um, providing an opportunity for, for that to happen. Great. Thank you so much, Rod and Kim. Um, we can now open it up for questions and answers with Kim and Rod. So please enter any questions you may have into the Q&A box and we will get to as many as we can today. Pedro will be back on to help me with reading your questions so our panelists can answer. Thank you, Nicole, yeah. and thank you, uh, Rod and Kim. That, 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 that was a fantastic conversation and, and so important, not just for the communities that you respectively work with, but I think as we do our work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, these are the difficult conversations that we continually have to have. And I believe that you have already answered this first question that was asked, which was asked early on, um, how and in what ways do you see ALA working with Native Hawaiians and AAPI communities to engage in lung health issues to better understand and reduce the burden of disease. I feel that this last question, this your last answers really got to the heart of that. So I'll move on to a different question, which is in your experience, what is driving COVID-19 hesitancy in the communities that you work with? Uh, Kim, do you want to start? Or Rod, I'm sorry, if you, you were about to. Yeah, I was actually going to respond to that first question a little bit more, and then I'll turn it okay, over great, to, him, great. to your question. Um, and I did really want to mention um, that historically, a lot of it has been kind of at a event or an activity by an activity basis. So a translation of a, of a brochure or an offering of a class. And I really encourage Lung and, and organizations to think long term. So really, it's about a partnership. Um, so that it isn't just kind of a one-off, but that, you know, what gets really developed is trying to get at some of those core foundational issues and that change of how communities, um, you know, are supported in addressing, you know, uh, certain health issues and health equity issues. So long-term sustainable change, I think, is what I would really emphasize. That's wonderful. Kim, do you want to step in? No, I completely, I completely agree. Wonderful. Um, well, how about the next question, Kim, uh, about what do you believe is driving vaccine hesitancy amongst Native Hawaiian populations, specific Islander populations in your, in, in your work? Right. Um, I don't know if it's really hesitancy. I think part of it is, do they have the confidence in the vaccine? Do they have the information in the vaccine? And what we're finding at many of the vaccine distribution events is that they're not hesitant. They just have a few questions. And it, you know, and it seems like the way the surveys are running now, have you been vaccinated? Yes. If no, you must be hesitant. But I don't think that's the, you know, that's the label for those that have not been vaccinated. I think that many are, well, I have a couple of questions. Tell me a little bit more. How long has it been in development? How, you know, how bad are the side effects? I think that we're way past all of the crazy zombie talk about it. People have real questions uh, about the efficacy um, of the vaccine, uh, which is not to say that there are not some who will not. And I think it's really just a matter of providing that information. And that's our responsibility to provide the accurate information, timely in information, and in a way that is received appropriately acceptable information to the communities that, um, you know, that perhaps seek more confidence in the vaccine. Thank you so much for that. Um, Rod, this is a question that is directed at you. Uh, it's about the Asian smokers quit line uh, that has been, that was uh, piloted and, and, and has been active in a while, been very heavily promoted across the California. We definitely have promoted it in Hawaii and other places. If you wanted to, if you had any lessons learned from that, from having a quit line that is specific uh, to, that a service that is in language for Asian Americans. 
Well, I think it's important just to, um, you know, share that that it is available, that there are four Asian languages, Cantonese, Mandarin, Korean, and Vietnamese, um, that is available in any states. Um, and thank you to Hawaii and other states that have really been helping to promote it. It is such a, a valuable service. Um, we had a webinar recently where um, we talked to Sherry from the Asian Smokers Quit Line, um, you know, whether there were, you know, any additional calls and, and actually there ha had not been, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a kind of a, a need for that. What I would like to say is that we really should take it a step further. We see the success of um, having a line that is in language for um, Asian American subgroups. There are other Asian subgroups that still need services and, and some that have high smoking rates. For example, the Khmer and the Lao communities. Um, and there are also communities perhaps that um, speak English or have English as a primary language. And this could include some Pacific Islander communities that, that may benefit from such a, um, a quit line as well. So it isn't just about language, it's about having a place that community members can go that they feel safe, that they can share, and that they are confident that they're going to get support in addressing, you know, tobacco addiction. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and let's, you know, I, I feel that you talked a bit about this, but I, I would like to sort of underline it. What policies would you recommend that we pursue to bring about more equity within Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and Asian American communities? Uh, Rod, would you like to start with that? Sure. Um, I already mentioned about the data disaggregation uh, policies that are happening here in California, so that's one. Um, we are working on resources um, to do health equity interventions that are community-led, and that's all for um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, Asian Americans, and other communities of color. Um, so that's kind of another, another place. Um, we're really excited about um, FDA finally um, banning menthol. Um, that's a long time in coming. Um, so I think my, my response is, you know, really equity-centered policies. And that can be resources, that can be addressing specific issues for our populations, whether it's tobacco, diabetes, language access, or whatever. Um, but I think my takeaway um, that I feel is really important is that we focus on whether a policy is equity-centered and how it's gonna ultimately impact communities. And is it engaging communities in the process of um, the development and, and implementation? I agree with all of that, the pat particularly the desegregation and community-led, and not just any uh, community of color, but the specific communities that you serve. You know, make it relevant. Um, and that's all I would add on to um, Rod's excellent answer. Pedro, can I mention one more thing too? Of course. Yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, whatever we do, whether it's services, policy, whatever, it's really dependent on the environment thing. And we've talked about COVID, but we haven't talked about the rise um, the dramatic rise in anti-Asian hate and hate crimes. Um, and it really an anti-immigrant stance over many years through the last administration, including public charge, which was threatening to take away benefits for those who were interested in eventually becoming citizens in this country. And not to, you know, underscore the importance of, we need to address those things as well. And we've seen some legislation proposed um, in the current administration and in certain states around addressing, you know, anti-Asian hate. Um, but we have to, we have to be able to dedicate time and attention to those issues if we're going to want to address other health issues like tobacco, diabetes, or, or whatever it may be. We really need to um, address how our communities are being impacted in a, on a daily basis. Hey. Thank you, Rod. So we can move forward with concluding today's webinar. We are just on time. 
And I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to all of today's speakers, uh, Rod Liu and Kim Burney, for sharing so much good information today and to all of our attendees for the questions and interaction. If your, if your question was not addressed in this webinar today, we will get to it and respond to you um, privately. As a reminder, I highly encourage you to take some time to explore our free re resources and programs on all things lung health at www.lung.org and the section that we have specifically on Asian American, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, which is placed once more in the chat. We thank you for joining today's webinar. If you would like to go back and review the presentation, you can access the on-demand recorded version at the link in your registration confirmation. This concludes our webinar. Thank you and have a great day.